Úgyhogy tisztelt Hölgyeim és Uraim, következzék John Gerzema. John, welcome. Um, what an amazing evening. Isn't that music fantastic in that panel? It was uh, absolutely enjoyable. Uh, what I'd like to do briefly is talk to you a little bit about my research and make an argument in the next half hour that we are on the cusp of a feminine age. And I'm going to do that by uh, explaining a little bit about my book, The Athena Doctrine. If I can go to the next slide, please. There it is. Well, let's start with the research. Um, as Norbert mentioned, I, I gather research around the world, and what I am trying to do is to understand changes in leadership, changes in society. And so what we did is we, we commenced a study to look at 13 countries and about 64,000 people. So we gathered data from a range of different countries around the world to represent market development, to, to represent culture and, and various aspects. But we also traveled around the world. Uh, my co-author, Michael D'Antonio, and I uh, spent uh, two years traveling to 26 different cities. I think I had hair when I started this project. <laughs> um, but what we wanted to do was take a, an understanding of what's happening in the 21st century, right? How are leaders adapting to a world that is fundamentally different than most people think of from the 20th century? And so, we gathered uh, a lot of different interesting thinkers. We also talked to chefs, but we talked to leaders in, in science, technology, education, and math. We talked to politicians, we talked to startups, CEOs, just a whole range of different people to try to understand how they were thinking about leading in the 21st century. And one of the guys we talked to was this guy uh, from the, the president of Israel, Shimon Peres. And he said something to me I will never forget. He said, we're in a new world with many old minds. We're in a new world with many old minds. Now, I thought this was curious from a, a guy who just turned 90 years old, but he talked about his leadership and the desire to want to be a servant leader and a leader who is adapting to a social open economy. See, what happened was he had just come back from spending time with Sheryl Sandberg and Mark Zuckerberg. And he went on to talk to us about what are the qualities of a leader that when you need to deal with an open social economy like a Facebook economy. So, you know, those are the types of things that we saw around the world. And I realized in, in understanding a little bit about your strategies focusing on particularly the Far East for market development that I thought I might share a little bit of our data and put a few of the... Um, the Asian countries down below. So one of the things we saw around the world was a, a lot of pessimism, questioning whether life would be better for their children. Now, that wasn't the case in China or India or even Indonesia, but you can see the difference between developed economies and these fast-growing markets. Um, we also saw around the world a, a, a challenge in the belief that there's too much power in institutions and in corporations, and how do we become more connected as well as empathy. We heard this word in the previous session, and I'm gonna to touch on this today, empathy becoming a really important question of our political leaders. And then um, this question of fairness. Again, while China, Indonesia, India don't feel this way, uh, other countries around the world feel that the world isn't really set up uh, to be fair. And so we thought that with that sort of pessimism in, in, in place, a couple of the things that we found that were quite interesting was one of the questions that said, we asked, would the world be a better place if men thought more like women? And it was interesting to us that two-thirds of people around the world felt that. Now, when you get into the data and you do the interviews, it really wasn't about gender. It wasn't about men versus women. It was actually about the masculine structures that we have from the 20th century, right? The political gridlock, the, the over-conservative ways in which sometimes business uh, thinks about women in, in the workplace, the way we think about inclusivity, the way we think about innovation. And so these more feminine qualities that we're going to talk about really align nicely with what is happening in the world today. So what we did is we designed a study. We got interested in this topic and we asked half our sample to take 125 different words and tell us whether they felt that they were masculine, feminine, or neither. Now in the other half of the sample, now this time without any gender whatsoever, 
we asked that, ver that group to take these very same words and to tell us which of these are the qualities that are most important in the ideal modern leader, which will make us more happy and successful in society, in our relationships with our families. And one of the things that we saw, really interesting to us anyway, was that the essence of a modern leader, 64,000 people around the world think is more feminine. So you start to see that least correlated to the ideal modern leader were things like aggression, pride, independence. I mean, that almost sounds like a stereotypical leader, right? The, the sort of stereotypical CEO. And yet in its place were these words like empathy, selflessness, flexibility, expressiveness, whether a leader can express her or his position to their team to understand where they're taking their company or where they're taking a political movement, make that relatable to people. And so these qualities we got really interested in and as we traveled and did our research, we also learned and understood that this wasn't about women versus men. In fact, obviously all of us have these qualities in our lives, but are we bringing them into our leadership? And so people around the world believe that you need both masculine and feminine qualities in, in order to navigate today's world. So what we did looking at the research and our travel is we kind of got to uh, 10 different important traits that need to be built into leaders, that need to be adopted by people based on their personal qualities and their own personalities. But importantly, we also need to value these in each other. We need to build these into our, into our teams and we need to cherish them inside organizations. Now, before you go on and say to me, well, that just, these don't sound like words that are about strength. Now, clearly, leadership is also about decisiveness. It's about resilience. It's, it's about fortitude. But we started to see that these qualities, even things as, as strange as vulnerability, are actually very powerful examples of ways to lead in the 21st century. So I'll, I'll give you a, a quick example of a vulnerable leader. This is a guy that I met in Berlin. His name is Dr. Ayad Maddish. And the story goes, he told me that he was at Harvard working on his experiments. And he kept getting stuck, and he went to ask his colleagues for help. And they told him, they said, you know, you look a little foolish asking for all this help. You know, you have a PhD, you should have all the answers. And he realized that science was all about me. It wasn't about we. And he felt that there could be a very interesting way to bring scientists together if they were open and honest about what they didn't know. So he created researchgate.org. Now today, researchgate.org, which is a Facebook for scientists, now has nearly three million scientists collaborating on 800,000 different research projects. And I asked him, I said, Dr. Manish, what do you want to do with this, with this business, this idea? And he said, I want to crowdsource a Nobel Prize. And I want to have the credits flow like at the end of a movie screen. Now my point about Dr. Maddish is, he took his vulnerability, his openness, his humility, and he said to others, I don't have all the answers, and a whole bunch of other people joined in to help. And I think that's really an apt metaphor for the 21st century. This is the type of businesses that are being scaled very quickly when people are vulnerable, when they're open and they're honest and they work well together. Another example uh, of an interesting leader we met was Major General Orna Barbabai. Now she's the highest ranking woman anywhere in the world in a military uniform. And I asked her how she approached military strategy and she said, as a mother. And I was curious by that and she said, well, first, don't try to cross a mother. <laughs> but she went on to talk about the need to bring in feminine qualities into management. And she talked specifically about the challenges she had at checkpoints at the Syria and Gaza Strip, specifically. And the fact that there was too much conflict, too much hostility, because there was a lack of esteem treated toward Arabs coming in to work each day into Israel. So she created a, a medal and a system of commendations to soldiers that actually de-escalated conflict. 
And to make her point very clear, she t stationed two of her daughters at the checkpoints, along with women soldiers for the first time from the IDF. So again, sort of an open, sort of vulnerable approach to thinking about leadership. One of the things we saw around the world was a lot of crisis, and we saw a feminine response to crisis. If you think about when things are really terrible, it's usually when we're at our best. We're focused on our compassion, on our empathy, and our understanding. And that was the case in Iceland. Uh, this is me, um, Orrin Bardur Johnson, and he's a constitutional committee member for the Icelandic parliament. Now, there you know that bankers basically took the country uh, into systemic bankruptcy, and the trust in government was at zero. Well, we went into Reykjavik, and he was uh, named a constitutional committee member because he had been someone who had criticized the government for many years and had earned some favorability. But what they decided to do was rather than simply develop a new constitution on their own, they would take it to the public. And using Facebook, Instagram, all these different social media, Twitter, they basically got input from people. They crowdsourced a draft of a new constitution in order to repair that trust and to bring people back into the political process in a very open and inclusive way. So these collaborative business models are really interesting. We're seeing them in politics all over the world. Uh, this is Leo Riske. He's the uh, cultural attache from Helsinki, and he's standing in front of the Felisus. Does anyone know about the Felisus in Berlin? So this is the first shared embassy in the world. It's home to the five Nordic nations of Denmark, Norway, Iceland, Sweden, and Finland. And as opposed to most embassies that are closed off and, and like walled gardens, this is much more like a college campus. You know, basically diplomats move freely together and they collaborate. And what Leo talked about was the humility of the countries putting aside their own individual ideals to work together in ways that they could expand their economic growth and their political clout. One of the things I noticed when I left, he said, uh, look across the street, and I've done a Google map for you, and you can see that directly across the street from the Felisus is the Syrian embassy that at the time was shuttered and covered in graffiti. Sort of a stark contrast between this sense of openness and, and a government that is not yet at the moment. Now, we saw really interesting business models being played out in terms of public-private collaboration. This is Emily Bolton. Uh, she works at Social Finance, and they create social impact bonds. Really interesting programs here where they get the private sector involved. And so one of the programs they designed was a, a bond that would reduce the rate of reoffending prisoners in the British prison system. Now, what became really interesting is that they figured out that if they could get the rate below 7.5% per year, private investors would profit. So guess what happened? These investors got involved in drug counseling, uh, job counseling, basically rehabilitating these prisoners with enlightened self-interest in mind. And the net result was the government saved on future costs, there were fewer people in prisons, and private investors profited. So it's this type of creativity that we're seeing in these models as people start to use the internet and expand in new ways to think about multiple forms of winning. Now, if you think of winning and losing, we always think of it as a zero-sum game, which is a very masculine 20th century construct. This is about how do you create multiple positive outcomes for more people so you can actually really make some profound change. An uh, amazing country we spent time in was Kenya. Uh, and this is Bob Collymore, who runs Safaricom. Uh, he's a CEO of a telco. There they have text-based messaging platform called M-Pesa. M-Pesa now runs two-thirds of the Kenyan economy because businesses now have a safe way to move money to pay workers without fears of extortion or fears of corruption. What's really amazing about, though, what Bob is doing is that he's taken that information and turned it around to educate people by giving free maternal information through text all types of education platforms, and he envisions an online university where kids in rural villages can use their phone through a, 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 a Safaricom platform with an educator to basically get a, an education. So you're seeing also activist private enterprise getting involved. 
And one example of a great program that they do at Safaricom is working with Rose Goslinga. These right behind her are these little um, weather vanes and they measure precipitation on farms. The, basically they work in a way that help farmers afford crop insurance because it's too expensive to go out and to see a claim of, of a farmer if they have drought. But here, they can use this information, send it to Safaricom, and text the farmers new payments. What's happened already is that 12,000 farmers have signed up for this program. So a public and private company in the works. We're seeing interesting business models being built off of the post-financial crisis. This is Giles Andrews of Zopa. He's the co-founder. Zopa stands for Zone of Possible Agreement. This is peer-to-peer -peer lending. And Zopa just crossed the 500 million pound threshold of a business after being only in business for two years. What's fascinating to me about their business model is that borrowers and lenders get better rates based on personal connections and their own character. Right? They're not going through an institution, they're actually connecting together to determine each other's credibility and that in turn determines their market value. We're also seeing a lot of millennial driven businesses that are being created. And one of the themes we saw as we traveled around the world were that millennials wanted to build values and accountability into their businesses. So their startups always seem to have this values component. Now this is Tim Kunde and uh, he's a entrepreneur in East Berlin. And he realized that most people don't value or have a relationship with insurance companies. Do you care about insurance companies? Anybody in the room? It's kind of a low interest concept, right? Well, he wanted to put a motion into insurance. So he created friend insurance. And the way it works is this. Let's say the first row, you guys all want to get car insurance. You would go in together. And if everyone drove safely, your claims, uh, your rates would actually go down. But if one of you got in an accident, all of you would pay that claim and your rates would go up. So just think about your friends and who you would do this with, right? But the point is, is that he created an insurance that became emotional. This is behavioral economics. He found through his data that people were driving more safely, that they were actually taking care of themselves more better because they wanted to be accountable to their friends rather than some nameless, faceless institution. So an interesting way to think about emotion and accountability. Now we were in Stockholm on a freezing March morning to interview Jonas Vig and Mans Alder. And these guys created a startup called Bamboozer. What happens with Bamboozer is if you turned on your cell phone to start to take video, it would instantly broadcast that video to the internet. And they thought they were creating an interesting entertainment platform only to find out that they got shut down by the Egyptian government. They were actually the first company shut down even before Twitter during the Arab Spring because kids were using this technology to broadcast what was happening. What I think is fascinating about this model is that these two guys of very poor to moderate hygiene, I spent time with them, these young men had more power at the moment than the Egyptian government. And that is what we're seeing in the 21st century. That is why governments need to be accountable, why businesses need to be open and porous, and why leaders need to understand that there's always someone with a video camera. And so that, that I think is a really interesting way to think about how power is being dispersed in today's world. Now sometimes, um, the people that we met were really interesting and they had problems that on the surface could seem kind of amusing. Uh, this is Maria Ziv and she's the head of the Swedish Tourism Bureau. And she does her own research just like me and she found out that around the world the top two things that people think about Sweden are blonde people and ABBA. <laughs> it's kind of a challenge for her because she wants people to know the real Sweden. So, if you uh, have a Twitter account, you must follow this account. It's called At Sweden. It's the government's Twitter account. Maria and her colleagues went to the government and asked for the Twitter account. 
which they then turned over to one Swedish citizen to tweet for a week on behalf of the country. Right, so your job was, if you were a truck driver, was to represent your country, an enormous responsibility. But in the process, they started to learn and value each other's citizenship role in really putting the best foot forward for their country through this interesting social experiment. Uh, we met all kinds of amazing people around the world. Uh, I would have to say that my time in Japan was most humbling and probably most emotional. Uh, we were there right after the earthquake and the tsunami, ab about maybe nine months later, and the country had yet to recover. And I knew that feeling uh, growing up uh, and being in lower Manhattan during our 9-11. And when I talked to people, they felt helpless, they felt patriotic, uh, they loved their country and they didn't know what to do. But one of the things that also happened in Japan is that young people got frustrated with the government because they didn't think the government moved fast enough to help people. And so this kid, this kid Fukazaki-san, he decided to do something about it. So I'm showing you a picture of him in his dorm room at Tokyo University. And he told me one afternoon that as he was watching the news and realizing that the government was not helping displaced people, he got an idea. He told me, I decided to hack an Airbnb. What he means in code language, hacker language, is he decided to rip off their business and make his own website. And he did. He created roomdonor.jp. And it was a very simple website. On one side, you could sign up if you had a room to loan to someone. On the other side, you would sign up if you needed a room or housing, if you had lost your house. Ladies and gentlemen, he moved 12,000 people in three weeks out of his dorm room in Tokyo University. He was moving faster and more effective than the government. And my point about his story is really, I think, pertinent to this whole discussion we're having this evening, which is the nature of leadership does not flow top down in the old 20th century model. This is leadership. This is leadership on a small scale. It's leadership that comes up and is absolutely the type of leadership that millennials around the world in our data and in our interviews associate with the way that they believe they're gonna change the world. And so these millennial values in this sort of accountable personal leader, we saw them all over the world. We met Sylvia Lali at the woman's house in Lima, Peru. Now, Sylvia had a problem, a terrible problem, domestic abuse toward women, and the police took a blind eye to the problem. The reason they did is that the police force at the time was all male. And she told me, I got really upset about it, so I decided to create my own all women's police force. And it became very effective. So effective that when the government decided to integrate the men and the women police officers together, corruption dropped by 30%. My point about her, and, and I think the point of our leadership lessons that we un understand now, is that she, like many of these other Athena thinkers, they put their whole selves into their challenge. They didn't just go to a job. They thought through and made creative solutions because they put their whole selves into what they were doing. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about empathy. This is a really interesting guy. He's um, from the MIT um, Age Lab in uh, Boston. His name is Dr. Joseph Coughlin, and he is studying aging. Now, many aging societies in Western Europe and in America, this has very big interest to companies and to governments as we think about our aging, uh, our aging people and our population. So what he did, though, is he had designers and engineers create a suit called Agnes. Agnes stands for Age, Gain, Now, Empathy System. Now, I don't have a photo of this, but I'll try to explain it to you. He basically created this suit that looks like a goalie uniform for hockey. And the designers and engineers have to walk around and it dulls your joints, it puts pressure on your back, it dulls your eyesight and your hearing. And then they ask the designers and engineers to go drive cars. 
to go get um, onto a bus at a public bus stop, to go into a grocery store and reach for a product off a store shelf. Basically, they're saying to these designers, don't just think about your customer, live that customer's life. And so I think this idea of the fourth wall of empathy, of breaking through to really connect, has, I think, really interesting impacts as with the way we think about innovation and understanding. Again, we found some very phenomenal Athena thinkers. A couple of them that were men, by the way. Um, one is Mauricio Facio Lince, and he is the number two highest rated government official in Medellin. Medellin is a fascinating marketplace today. Um, long gone are the, the, the stereotypes of drugs and violence as this city is remaking itself into a very interesting cosmopolitan and cultural center. But one of the things that uh, Mr. Lindsay and his cabinet did was make a bet on young people. And so they devoted two thirds, 63% of the Medellin city municipal budget for the next five years to children, basically to kids under 20. In the belief that if they had after school programs, education, maternal programs, they could break this systemic cycle. I think what's fascinating about that is that many of these leaders were not trying to solve the same problem the traditional way. They were trying to attack them in new ways, and I think he's definitely an example. Another example of empathy and innovation comes from um, Medellin as well. This is Margarita Angel Bernal, and she is one of the few um, engineers civil engineers in Colombia. Now, one of the big successes that she is credited for is the Medellin Metro Cable. Perhaps you've heard of it, a, an ingenious um, cable car system that moves 30,000 Colombians a day from the poor areas of the favelas into the city for work. And she did it not by sitting behind her desk, but by going out and listening and working with people to really understand the needs of society. Uh, we traveled everywhere. We were actually even in Bhutan, and we interviewed the secretary of the Gross National Happiness Commission. I think what's great about that is you get your own parking spot that says it. But what is fascinating to me is this tiny, tiny mountain kingdom is at Davos, has journalists go and visit them because they talk about gross national happiness, opening up our aperture on GDP, thinking about our total society, not just thinking about money. And I think what they've struck a chord in is something that's really missing in many countries, which is why they've become so popular. I'll share with you two last stories, um, but one of the really amazing stories we met were two guys caught in the middle of a war, but they were also best friends. This is Yadin Kaufman and Saeed Neshef, one an Arab, one an Israeli, both of them are venture capitalists. They cannot solve the problems in the Middle East, but they thought they could do what they do best, which is create startups. Now, Veritas Ventures is an incredible, incredible successful Israeli startup VC fund. And Sadara Ventures is a fledgling starting Arab startup. And it's in the West Bank. So Yadin and, and uh, Sahid got together and decided to create a program that for taking money of any Israeli startup into the VC fund, they had to give up 2% of their stock. The belief was if any of these companies would go public and make a lot of money, that stock could be invested into the Arab startups. Well, they just sold Waze, the traffic navigation system, to Google for $3 billion. So what Sahin and Yadin believe is that they can work together, they can create startups in the West Bank, and they can start to educate collaboration between the next generation of people, Arabs and Israelis. And lastly, one of my favorite interviews, I believe, this was um, Eriko Yamaguchi. Um, she has a pretty amazing story. Um, she um, lives in Tokyo now, um, but she grew up in Japan and she was bullied terribly as a child. And because she was bullied, she decided, her parents decided to send her home for homeschooling. And while she was there, she started to get an interest in fashion. But she also told me she didn't want anyone to go through what she had went through. 
So she got uh, onto the internet one day and she told me she typed into Yahoo, what's the poorest country in Asia and discovered it was Bangladesh. So she got a Kickstarter fund and she got some investment money from her, from her friends and family and she went to Dhaka and she leased a factory. She, her goal was she was gonna teach illiterate factory workers that were making bags, basically sacks of grain and potatoes, she was gonna teach these workers to make high quality handbags. It had never been done before. And in truth, it took her three years to get anything of good quality. But in the end, today, she now has seven stores in Japan. She has a thriving, successful business, and she pays her workers double the average wage in, um, in Bangladesh, which is, I think, a true testament to her fortitude. So I guess as we think about the idea of the master and the servant, and we think about how power is changing, we should step back lastly and look at the data because the definition of power is no longer about control. Maybe for a few people, they believe that, but really people around the world believe that power is about influence. And influence can come in a whole host of very interesting ways, many of whom I would argue are feminine. And that's why we really believe that in today's world, both men and women have access to this incredible power if they choose to use it, which is why we believe in this open, social, interdependent economy, in this economy driven by globalization, driven by understanding your customers, absolutely an imperative to work closely and to collaborate together that feminine values are the operating system of the 21st century. I'll leave you with, uh, with this. Um, Norbert introduced uh, the book, but all proceeds of our book support the Girl Up campaign www.girlup.org from the United Nations. It's an amazing campaign. It basically helps um, young girls find their voice as leaders by advocating for at-risk girls around the world. Again, thank you very much for your time tonight, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening.